get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm especially excited. We have Chris Voss. He spent 24 years in the FBI and was the FBI's lead international kidnapping and hostage negotiator for four years. He was an instructor of international business negotiation at Harvard and is an adjunct professor at Georgetown and University of Southern California MBA programs. He has written one of my favorite books of all time. I do listen to three to six books per week, and this is one of my favorites. I've listened to it three times. He's the author of Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if Your Life Depended on It. And he founded the Black Swan Group, which is a negotiating consulting firm that applies his field-tested lessons of hostage, crisis, and kidnapping negotiation to the business negotiation world. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, man. An absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me It's on. my pleasure. And there's so many good stories, but there's practical advice all along the way in your book. And I wanted you to give people an idea on what your methods can do. I want you to talk about what happened leading up to when Abu Sayyad called to give one of your negotiators an actual compliment. Well, you know, we, uh, we had a kidnapping in the Philippines and it was a $10 million ransom demand, and we managed to take the $10 million uh, down to zero in one conversation about halfway through that wow. negotiation. And then ultimately, because we really sort of disorganized the other side, our hostage walked away, which left uh, the bad guys with nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. They were, um, they were beaten. I mean, we, we, we won. And about two weeks after the kidnapping was over, um, the, the, the main bad guy, the, the, the terrorist sociopath, called the negotiator I was coaching and said, have you been promoted yet? You really stopped me from doing what I was going to do and they should promote you. Wow. So it was the ultimate demonstration of respect as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So what did you do? What were some of the things that you did to get to that place? Well, what we really did was, first of all, we took a, we, uh, you know, we took a sort of a stealth approach. I mean, uh, empathy, um, tactical empathy, weaponized empathy, military-grade empathy. I mean, it, it is a stealth weapon. It's an absolute stealth weapon, especially with a hostile adversary. And we took a, uh, this, this tactical, empathic approach where we knew we would sugar breakthroughs, we would break down his defenses, we knew that it would, we'd remove all of his aggression with it. I mean, empathy removes aggression. And the other side has no idea that you did it to him. And, you know, the, the, the hallmark of that is when you get to the other side to say that's right. Now, you're right. You know, you're right. We joke in my company is the equivalent of F off. Right. You know, you're right is what you say to people that you want to maintain a relationship with or at least you try not to make them mad, but you want them to shut up and go away. Right. That's, that's why we say you're right. And that's why it's really bad. But when you say that's right, it triggers changes. Uh, I wish I had the brain science behind it. We haven't got it yet. But I know it triggers changes. Yeah. And so we decided we had one goal and one conversation with this killer. We're going to get him to say that's right. We're going to summarize everything, uh, how he's coming from and how he feels about it. That's the important thing. I said to, uh, you know, what the difference this makes is I said to Andrew Ross Sorkin when I was on Squawk Box on CNBC, I said, don't be afraid to say, what the other th side thinks is true. And he was like, what? You know, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not something bad. you would expect, especially if it's bad, yeah. especially if it's bad. And so that's what we did with this terrorist killer in the Philippines. We, we said what he thought was true 
So the, he has no argument. It's what happens to people when you take all their arguments away. Yeah. Um, it stops them dead in their tracks. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so he said, he literally said, that's right, and went dead silent. I mean, it was this incredible moment of silence between the killer and my negotiator. Right. And then after they just kind of sat there, and a moment is three seconds, which seems like an eternity. And he said, you know, let's talk again in a couple of days. And at the start of the conversation, it was a $10 million ransom demand. And at the end, it was gone. And it was never brought up again. Wow. And that's, that's what you want to do. You want to, you want to leave them with nowhere to go. So, Chris, what was the most outlandish thing that you and the other negotiator had to say of what he was thinking to get him to that's right? You know, it was uh, because he, he had this nonsense about $10 million worth of um, war damages for the last 500 years from the Spanish to the Japanese to the Americans. And it was a violation of the fishing rights. And it was, you know, the aggression of colonial powers coming into areas that they weren't invited and taking over. And it was unjust. And it was unfair to the region. And there were all these war damages. Yeah. And it's kind of the opposite of venting. I mean, it's preventing venting, if you will. Because, you know, when, you vent pe when people vent, they just get madder and madder and madder. And they you know, seem to spiral out of control. Right. And you sort of close your eyes and put your hands over your ears and wait for them to finish. And they never seem to finish. Right. But when you preempt it and you take all their words away, I mean, they're left... Uh, deflated, if you will, diffused. Right. And that's exactly what happened in this case, especially when you say it from their perspective, because they got nothing left to say. And some of the brain science I know now, every, every, every thought that we have runs through the caveman part of our brain, the amygdala, the lizard brain, the chimpanzee brain, right. however you want to you wanna view it. Yeah. And it shuts that section down. Yeah. And there's actual brain science now that shows how that shuts down. And it kind of leads... You know, if you say something to somebody that catches them off guard, I mean, they actually become disoriented. You see them shake their head because they lose their balance. Yeah. I'm sure Sabaya almost fell over when we did this to him. What was, I'm really curious, when he gets on the line, when you get on the line with him for the first time, what did he say? What's the tone of his speech and what did he say? Well, he's demanding. Is it super aggressive or what does it sound like? You know, it's Donald Trump. This is what I want. I want it now. Give me an answer. Yes or no. Hmm. Where's my $10 million? I want it now. I mean, that was what we dealt with from the very beginning. And, yeah. and we just, you know, we came back at him soft. And, and when you don't fight back with a fighter, it's they punch the air and, it, and, it, and they punch themselves out. And, mm -hmm. and then when you diffuse their, their arguments, they, get, they punch out even faster. And that's what we did to them. Yeah. My favorite that's right is with your son, the story about <laughs> with your son. Right. Yeah, you know, and so same thing, trying to get a that's right out of somebody. So my son's playing football. I like the parenting one. So, yeah, that, that's one of the motivations of reading the book. There's business applications and the parenting. It's like my three-year-old trying to get their shoes on. It's like a hostage negotiation. Like, I, I can't get them to do it. So, yeah. yeah you, think, you think dealing with a terrorist hostage takes a chance <laughs> with a three-year-old, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> or a 13-year-old. So, yeah, what happened with your son? All right, well, he's playing football, and uh, they move him from lineman to linebacker, and he won't change his game. Linemen hit everything. Linebackers dodge and weave and bob. Right. Um, and as a lineman, that was against his code. The code of the lineman is to crack everything you see and knock it down and smash it. Right. And it's a complicated blue-collar Nassau kind of a job because you're trying to hit moving targets. Now, the linebacker is... You know, a linebackers probably hate to hear to say this, but a linebacker is a little bit of a, it's a little more of a ballet dance. Be careful because your son's what six three three twenty five, so six three. He could take you. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, that's what you know. He, thank God, I raised him right. Right, you know, he believes in right and wrong. But uh, the linebacker's got to bob and weave. Yeah. The linebacker's got to dodge, and he's not doing it. And I'm trying to figure out why he's not doing it. And I realize that he thinks it's cowardly. And so, mm. and I'm telling him, and a coach is telling him, and every time we tell him he's got to change his game, you know what he says? You're right. You're right, yeah. <laughs> Which is shut up and leave me alone. Yeah. And, uh, and, of course, every time he said that to us, we thought, you know, we scored a victory. And he'd go right back to doing what he was doing before. So I'd take him off to the side, and, you know, I, I say, you know, you think that dodging someone who's trying to hit you is cowardly. 
You think that getting out of the way of someone who's trying to knock you down makes you less of a man. And it almost sounds like I'm trying to talk him into his position, but that's the way he saw it. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I said that to him, I mean, he, he literally just kind of goes silent. And he, and, and he looks down and he looks around and he says, that's right. And he started dodging blocks the very next day. And so they, I think in the book you talk about they go undefeated? <laughs> The, the team he was, won every game. He was he after that after he pl- after he made that adjustment. They were winning anyway. Yeah, yeah. But every game he played in, they won. Wow, that's amazing. You know, how did you figure out that that's right was that you should be consciously using? Because you probably unconsciously were using it. How did when did you figure out that you should consciously use that? Well, you know, I, I, I took it for granted. It was one of those subtle, obvious things because I kind of learned it as a fundamental sort of um, crisis intervention 101 from my days on a suicide hotline. Yeah. And I don't think that I'd specifically identified it really until I started, uh, consciously identified it until I started business negotiations. Yeah. But I look back at breakthrough moments and they all revolved around that's right. Mm. And like I said, it was something that I thought it was obvious. And, you know, the subtle obvious is maybe the key to the breakthrough, the black swan, if you will, the tiny little thing that makes a big difference. Right. And I looked back and I started to catalog the experiences in the business, in the hostage negotiations. And then right. especially the key was because I was still a hostage negotiator when I changed my son's behavior. And in pulling the book together, you know, the one game changer more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, because and don't try to get yes. You know, the original title of that chapter when we submitted to the publisher was yes is the last thing you want to hear. Yeah. And the publisher was like, what? That's crazy. How can yes be the last thing you want to hear? Right. We're like, oh. It's a paradigm shift. Yeah. Yeah, it's a complete paradigm shift. It's something completely different. And it was really why when we laid the claim that getting to yes is dead, um, that and that this is what you've heard about trying to get yeses wrong. This was a key issue, and then we went back and I started teaching in, in the classes I had at Georgetown, and people just started getting huge breakthroughs, mm-hmm. and not just with Americans. This is a this is a difference between this and uh, people ask me, is this cross cultural? It's subcultural. It appeals to the reptilian brain that's in everybody's head. Yeah. And hits the emotions. And we've all got the same emotional makeup. You know, whether you're Chinese, Korean, African American, Latin American, Irish. We've all got the same emotional makeup. And this is this is what makes one of the things more powerful. Was there a point that you remember that light bulb that that's right, that made you go back and think of all those catalog moments? Or was it just a progression? Yeah, um, it was actually when I started, about the time I started working on the book. And I was also trying to lay the information out in a more concise fashion. Right, right. And then to, to make a point, the best way to make a point is to make it three times for the same different ways. Right. Uh, so it becomes three-dimensional. And the most three-dimensional point from a hostage negotiation to a negotiation with my son to like a litany of business negotiations was was the that's right moment. And mm-hmm. when I pulled it all together, and I just bang, it yeah. was a light bulb for us. And what I thought was was going into reading the book that I didn't expect is a lot of, I mean, the no is is a big one, obviously, but the, the empathy component, kind of getting to that's right, you have to have like a lot of empathy for the other side. And this goes into what we were talking about before the we hit record, which people sometimes view negotiation as horrible, and what's fascinating is you, you see women don't want to read the book. Yeah, you know, and, and it's frustrated me because I think if, if anybody's natural born for this kind of approach to negotiation, which is ridiculously effective, by the way, it's women. And, and again, I, you know, and I, and, I, and I also worry about natural born. I think, I think the step from empathy, from sympathy to empathy is a shorter step yeah. from aggression to empathy. Uh, now, sympathy, there's problems with sympathy, but society wants women to be sympathetic. And so there's a tremendous amount of social feedback to try to get them to be that way. And society has historically, I think, raised men to be more competitive. I mean, we have combative sports. We have football. We have rugby. We have hockey, which women are now just slowly becoming a part of. 
Uh, the first organized hockey game I ever saw, I'm happy to say, was uh, the women's Olympic team playing hockey, which mm. I thought was awesome. I loved it. But so the societal pressures have really been more against women to be competitive and, and to be yeah. attacked. Yeah. And I think that's one of the differences. But, um, you know, like I, I'll run a Facebook ad for um, my book and or some of our negotiation teaching, and I'll open it equally to men and women. But I'll uh, try to earmark uh, interest in negotiation. No women click. Hmm. No women show an interest in negotiation. And there's a, a woman business executive, remarkably effective in Silicon Valley, that I was talking to recently. And her fiance is trying to get her to read the book. And she says, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to read a negotiation book. I don't want to get into conflict. Hmm. It's like, no, 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 read this book. This is different. Yeah. And she flat out told me before she met she saw before it was recommended, she says, I don't want to read a negotiation book. I don't want to get into conflict. Right. And this is about finessing inherent conflict right. and having it not be conflict. Yeah. It's like you'd almost have to redo the cover and the title and just say empathy is key or something. And then you'd have like the <laughs> same concept and all the women would buy it. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, this is not 1970s empathy either. This is not. Uh, this is why it's weaponized empathy. It's military grade empathy. I mean, we know enough about empathy now to have evolved our thought patterns, and it's not just broad, general, feel good empathy. I mean, we know now what different applications of it will do. So why not identify that in advance and use it in a very tactical fashion to, that appeals to both the missionary and the mercenary? The mercenary because it works. The missionary because it's. It's the uh, you have integrity when you do this. It, yeah. Whatever your code of morality is, it follows a legitimate code of morality. You're not exploiting others. Yeah, and, you know, Chris. One of my other favorite stories, and just to demonstrate, because it wasn't always like you could just get on the phone with a, you know, a hostage situation and defuse it. So I want you to go back to your suicide hotline days for a second. And okay, why why did you end up? training at the suicide hotline first all right so i was a mercenary <laughs> i tried to get on the fbi's hostage negotiation team and was appropriately shooed away because i had no credentials right what and, were you doing previous to that well i was a swat guy yeah i'd been on the swat team in a pittsburgh office of the fbi and then i was trying out for the bureau's version of the navy seals uh, the fbi's got a counter-terrorist tactical team mm -hmm. called a hostage rescue team and i yeah. was trying out for them Re-injured an old uh, knee injury. Um, had my knee put back together again. Uh, there are a couple of orthopedic surgeons that have very nice cars as, real, as a result of my knee. Right. So I try to make my contribution to the economics there. And then I just decided I'd hurt my knee enough times. I didn't want it to blow it out and have yeah. not be able to put it back together. So I was like, ah, I'll do a hostage, hostage negotiator. How hard could that be? You know, I'll talk to <laughs> Sounds hard to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so I went, but I had no crisis intervention, no education, no background, no psychology degrees. And I went to the woman who ran it in New York, Amy Bondaro, um, tough New York chick. I say that with great reverence and respect. And she was just like, go away. Uh, you got no resume. Everybody wants to be a hostage negotiator. Everybody thinks it sounds cool, which I did. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's, I thought it sounded cool. And I said, you know, there's got to be something I could do. And she said, there is. Go volunteer at a suicide hotline. Now, until you've done that, leave me alone. And so I went and volunteered and found some enormously behavior-changing skills. And the theory was, if you can change people's behavior under pressure, are the patterns the same? Are they just less intense? And mm -hmm. therefore, if they're less intense, do they still work? And the answer is yes and yes. The patterns are the same. They're less intense and it still works. And I had a, a conversation with a guy on a phone line. I said three things and completely changed his direction on, on the phone. And all that is applies directly to business and personal life. Yeah. But I mean, on one of those calls, you thought it went really well. But your well, supervisor. Yeah. Oh, you got to bring that up. Huh? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, and that, you know, that goes to the point that these are perishable skills. Right, exactly. And it's why, also why champions practice. 
you know, the, 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 the team that wins the Super Bowl, the team that wins the World Series, the yeah. team that wins the World Championship, they practice. The team that wins the NBA Finals, they practice because the application of the skills, um, performance-based skills are perishable. Yeah. And so I get trained on the hotline. I get, I get done with the training at the first part of the year, and I was sharp because the training was great. And I paid attention, and I'm coachable. That's you know one of the keys to life is whether or not you're coachable. Michael Jordan was coachable. There's nothing wrong with being coachable. Yeah. So I was coachable, but I didn't realize that my skills were diminishing over the course of the year because I was using them all the time, and I didn't feel the erosion. And a year later, I had a call on a hotline, and I thought I was a superstar. Right. I thought it was so good. Uh, that the caller that called actually congratulated me. And the supervisor took me off into the side room because it was the annual review, and he was like, you stank, you are horrible. And I remember being stunned by it because, and I even said, didn't you hear the guy congratulate me? He right. goes, that's the first problem. Right. Because, and let me tell you why. And he laid it all out for me, and that's when I, that was really, that was an aha moment in appreciation for training. You got, you got to train. You can't, you can't rely on the application of the skills alone to stay sharp it just doesn't work what was a big takeaway from the training that you still use um you know uh conscious practice and practice in low risk situations hmm. and using it in day-to-day -day conversations and you know tony robbins like to say no extra time net time you're going to have those day-to-day -day conversations yeah. anyway so if you know what a couple of the skills are, you know, mirrors, labels. Yeah. Use them in a day-to-day -day conversation where you got no skin in the game. You're yeah. going to have those conversations anyway. Yeah. The person's going to like you more, and then you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to perform when you have skin in the game yeah. because you, you will have practiced. And yeah. you've got feedback too. I mean, in a, in a normal conversation, and that, that was really because the first time I tried to use one of the skills with the woman who's now the ex-Mrs. Voss, and I applied it the same way I did on the hotline, and she blew up. I mean, screamed at me. Well, what did me. you use? Well, uh, the go to the go to label, if you will, on a hotline is anger. Mm. Um, like in business, the go to label is fear, and you call it concern. I got you. But I knew uh, on a hotline that the anger was underlying something somewhere. It's the profile. You're angry about something. You're angry about a loss. Yeah. You're angry about a slight. You're angry about a lack of appreciation. So I would always say, you know, I'd label it. I'd, I'd, I'd listen for it and I'd say you sound angry. Um, so then I'm in a conversation with the, the now ex-Mrs. Voss on a fundamental issue that was one of the reasons why things didn't work, work out. And I'm saying to myself, ah, you know, I hear anger. I got this one. So, and I said, you sound, you sound angry. It's a bang, 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 bang. I mean, blew up, blew up. Yeah. And I, and it was the, it was the application. It was the improper tactical. She wasn't just angry. She was angry at me hmm. and it colored. And I didn't see the difference because on a hotline, they're not angry at you. But when it's someone in your personal life, your professional life, it's not just anger. They're angry at you if they're right. talking. To you. Right. And I failed to recognize that. And that made me seem utterly ignorant to her at the time. And that, that was part of the whole adjustment process. You know, the tactical application of empathy is understanding how the other side sees it, not how you see it. Right. And I felt she had no right to be angry with me, so I couldn't say it. Yeah. You know, it gets us back to this that right moment, that's right moment. Right. Don't be afraid to say what the other side thinks is true, even if you don't agree, particularly, especially if you don't agree. Yeah. She had no right to be angry with me. I couldn't say it. Well, that was my perspective, and, th yeah. and that was really a, one, of the big, one of the big aha moments in, in tactically making an adjustment. Do you think when people are too close to it, it makes it much more difficult to do that? Well, yeah. When we're really close, we tend to think, well, your point of me is unfair yeah. or improper. Um, that's got nothing to do with empathy. That's yeah. why empathy is not sympathy. The tactical application of it is just really it's a mercenary skill. And they're actually, the sociopaths are the best at empathy. You know, if I want to throw a hand grenade into a conversation, I'll say, are sociopaths capable of empathy? 
Absolutely. I mean, even so much Daniel Goleman calls it cognitive empathy, and he says that they're better at it than anybody else is. Yeah. Because it works. So talk about labeling for a second for people who know, don't know what that is, but it's very powerful. All right, ridiculously simple, um, enormously powerful. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. It's just simply saying it sounds like, it looks like, it feels like, it seems like. And then it feels like you're blowing me off. It sounds like you think I've been a jerk. It looks like I don't have any appreciation for your position in this. Yeah. Um, those are just straight observations. And they're actually carefully worded. Um, the word I doesn't start it out. You know, I'm hearing you're angry. That's the wrong way to do it. It sounds like it looks like it feels like. Because then it's just an observation. And it pulls context out of the other side. And there's no such thing as an uh, answer that's only yes. And there's no such thing that the, an answer that's only no. It's yes and and no and. And the critical thing you're trying to get at is the ands. Mm. What goes with the answer? Right. And so a label pulls the rest of that out. And then once you understand label a negative, diminishes, label a positive, increases it. Yeah. If uh, I'm arguing with you about the New England Patriots, and let's say you're a New York Giants fan, and you hate the Patriots because of the allegations of their tactics. Right. And, but I don't want to say that. You could say to the person, it sounds like you really believe in fair play and instantly change the conversation. That's a labeling of a positive. And I, since I know that, I can pick those out in your brain and mm -hmm. punch that button at will as soon as I get out of my way. Right. I'm my biggest obstacle in any negotiation. Right. So people should definitely practice that in the day-to-day -day use so that when they get into some kind of business or other negotiation, it will be kind of more honed in yeah you can see it coming um and the day-to-day -day practice makes the recognition faster and you want to speed up your recognition because the brain works incredibly fast once it knows what it's looking for and right. what it wants to do with it yeah you know um uh i'm trying to think of uh, the boxer that is uh undefeated now great greatest of all time um mayfield uh floyd mayweather floyd, floyd mayweather all right so his, he sees every punch coming and gets out of the way. Right. His brain isn't any faster than ours. He just knows what he's looking for. Yeah. And that's what makes him this ridiculously invincible fighter because he sees this stuff coming. And that's, that's all what right. this is, is understanding what you're looking for and seeing it coming. And suddenly people uh, seem to have this great intuition. Everybody's brain is fast enough to do this. Yeah. It's a matter of knowing what you're looking for. So what are some common labels, Chris? So anger, you said, is one. What's, what's some other ones? Well, in, in business, everybody's going to have a, a concern over a loss. Um, we've, uh, I knew in hostage negotiation, we were taught look for the loss. That's going to trigger change in behavior. Yeah. Somebody's taken hostages, somebody's barricaded. In the last of 24 to 48 hours has been a loss, which triggered a, tra triggered a change in behavior. Business and real and personal life, there's a Nobel Prize winning theory that says that loss is our dominating influence. It's yeah. called prospect theory. Concern over loss is a dominating influence, and it's a fear of loss. I didn't make that up. Uh, the, the, the architect of that theory, Danny Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize because it's so right on. Right. So and that's what drives people in business, the fear of loss, the fear of loss of profits, the fear of loss of strat status. The fear of loss of promotion. Now they won't they won't use the word fear because we're not supposed to be afraid in business. But there are other adjectives for it. Concerns. Anxiety. Mm. So the label is gonna be, well, it sounds like you're concerned on the effect of your reputation of this deal. Yeah. It sounds like you're concerned about the long term implications of whether or not you make the deal. Mm. And that'll open up the conversation and it's an involuntary response on the other side. Because yeah. they, I'm punching that button and you're amygdala and the information's going to come out. Right. I love it, Chris. <laughs> I love this. Um, so you also mentioned mirroring, right? Um, talk about mirroring and how that applies, how people can practice that in everyday life. Right. And again, this is not your 1970s mirroring. Right. You know, this is not the uh, hippies with beads and tie-dyed shirts mirroring. 
this is a tactical, simple, yeah. yet um, incredible, invisible stealth approach. I think it's in the very, book you call it a Jedi mind trick. It's a Jedi mind trick. Yeah. You want to be Obi Wan Kenobi? This is this is your tool. Right. It's simply repeating the last one to three words of what somebody said. Right. Or us uh, when you when you really want to show off, you'll pick one to three words out of the middle that you want somebody to expand on. And uh, it's probably the only skill that feels, until you get used to it, if you're the user, it feels more awkward than labeling. And when It we does feel awkward. I was practicing it last night, and I told my wife what I was doing, and then I was doing it. And then five minutes later, she's like, oh, come on. You know, right, you know, as you're doing it naturally in conversation, it just um, almost just fits into the way the conversation goes. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it fits in and people love it. I mean, they want to go on. You know, my favorite example, um, like Howard Stern, one of the great communicators. He's got somebody on the line. I'm listening to his radio show and a person is marrying him because he's trying to, you know, they, they get a, uh, a listener on the line. Then they ignore him and see how long they can keep him on the phone. They used to do this all the time. I'm listening to radio in New York. Um, and they make fun of these people by ignoring them. And people go like, hey. And they just completely ignore him. Well, this list, this caller, Stern can't ignore him. And finally, he says, stop that. You're bothering me. And the listener says, you're bothering me? He says, yeah. He says, you're repeating everything I say. And she says, everything you say? He says, yeah. You keep repeating everything I say. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> he says, it's driving you crazy? He goes, yeah. You got it. You know, and he can't stop right. responding. There's, and every now, you know, I'll be teaching a class in, the, in an MBA program. And one of my students will start to mirror my answers in class just to keep me talking. Right. Uh, and I'll feel it. I mean, I'll have to. I know it's coming, and I have trouble right. resisting it. So, but we, we, the first time you try it, like you said, you think the other side is going to start screaming at you. Ah, I know what you're doing. It never happens. What's the most powerful use of mirroring that you've seen work? Um, uh, you know, mirror the other side. Uh, when they when they're giving you a take it or leave it offer, hmm. and they'll say, "Look, this is our offer to you. Take it or leave it." And you go, "Take it or leave it," and they'll go, "Yeah," because, and then they'll go on and on and on and start to talk. I mean, it really digs people out of the yes or no, open and shut situation, because they're actually trying to get you to understand, and there's more reasons there, and they're trying to hold them back from you. But they want to explain, explain more. It makes people feel powerful. And when people feel powerful, that's when they spill the beans. That's when they begin to vomit information. And right. that's what you need. You need to pull the information out. Yeah. The label's so powerful. The mirror is powerful. And the getting to know, which is counterintuitive. Um, can you talk about some of the most practical applications for that? And I, I practice that after listening to your book. The way I practice it is when I call someone on the phone. You mentioned this in the book. As I don't say, you know... I, I say, um, you know, are you able to talk? Are you in the middle of something? And they'll say, ah. no, I'm not in the middle of something. I can talk. So I practice that no by when I call anyone, I ask them, are you in the middle? You know, can you talk or are you in the middle of something? I like that one a lot. Yeah. yeah because most people, most people want to say, have you got a few minutes? Right. Which is looking for a yes. And yes, since yes is commitment, yes triggers anxiety because people worry about what they commit themselves to. You know, the other day I'm wearing a shirt that I know my girlfriend likes because she told me earlier in the day. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, I said, all right, so you said you said that you like the shirt, right? And she literally says to me, if I say yes, what am I committing myself to? Wow. Um, powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Because yes is commitment. It creates anxiety. And so the flip side is, you don't know which is the boogeyman that we're often taken hostage by. We fear no. Right. But no is protection every time. So are you in the middle of something? No. And when people protect themselves by saying no, they relax, they get focused, they want to listen. Uh, is now a bad time to talk is what we use uh, a lot. But I like are you in the middle of something a lot. I'm probably going to borrow well, that. It's because you of will. you. I started doing it. So thank you. Um, what have you seen in the um, business world where it's worked really well? Because um, it's counterintuitive getting people to no as opposed to yes. Right. Um, what we'll do, especially in, in the most common application we use, is people who stop responding on a business deal. Mm. Um, they're, they're not responding to emails. They're not responding to phone calls. They stop 
responding. A one-line email, have you given up on this project? Yeah. Instant, instant response, three to five minutes, um, because it's no, and it triggers a sense of loss. Have you given up on is also uh, yeah. hitting the prospect theory sense of loss, which is double the motivator. Yeah. And uh, you'll get, you if you send anybody an email or a text that says that, you better be sitting there waiting for an answer because uh, they're going to come back very yeah. quickly. That's a Jedi mind trick too. All these are Jedi mind tricks. Um, I love this. So go back, take me back, Chris, to Iowa. What was it like growing up in Iowa? I want to know what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were in Iowa. You know, uh, you know, the only thing I, I, I didn't want to be specifically, I wanted to be a cop once I got to my teens. You did? Yeah, uh, that, that was, uh, I saw a movie and I was inspired by the creativity of the police officers involved. But prior to that, I, I sensed my father was a businessman, entrepreneur, so he, he was, was uh, he was, yeah, he had, a, he had his own small business uh, that he bought into and built, very blue collar approach, hardworking, honest guy. And I wanted to be entrepreneurial yeah. in whatever I did. And so I applied that once I got into law enforcement, you know, just to try to be innovative. But, you know, growing up in Iowa, just blue collar family, uh, uh, an older sister, two younger. My parents' expectations of all of us was exactly the same. Hmm. Work hard, figure it out, keep up. Yeah. Um, which... You know, in, in my and I th the colors, my expectations of women today. I, you know, I see them as being capable of anything I'm capable of doing. And my attitude towards them is keep up. Yeah. You know, you want you and I are capable of the same things. Yeah. And I grew up in a in a keep up, stand up for yourself environment. And that's what yeah. I expect of others. Chris, I asked because okay, there's Michael Jordan, right? Everyone, you can teach people to play basketball. But there's some greats out there. And there's been tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of negotiators and not lead negotiators. So I'm wondering what, what do you think separates you? Because there's skill involved, right, in practice. But there's also an inherent natural ability, too. What, what is it with you that allowed you to excel in this particular profession and, and craft? Um, well, uh, openness. You know, I'm coachable. I'm willing to learn. I don't. I look back on my earlier days, and I, um, I'm not ashamed to admit I was ridiculously lacking in empathy. Really? So okay, I thought I think, you were going to say the opposite. No, 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 no. I think, um, but it, emotional intelligence is not like, EQ is not like IQ. You can't change your IQ. You can change your EQ. Mm. And if you're open to learning and you want to do a better way and you start listening, they can come to you very quickly. And there's, there's, uh, you know, the good news is uh, our EQ might be almost unlimited. And the data now has got us that we can continue to build and get better at EQ up through in our mid-80s. And I think that's because, you know, these days active businessmen are lasting until their mid-80s. And in 10 more years, they're going to say you can improve your EQ to age 100. So I was open to learning. I wanted, I told Amy I wanted to learn. And I wasn't joking around. I wanted to learn. And so it's a teachable skill. You don't have to have it naturally in you. I think a harder thing is to be an effective negotiator, you do need to be assertive. You have to be able to assert your own best interest, mm -hmm. which is what empathy is for. Mm -hmm. Empathy, tactical application of empathy is a precursor to assertion. Some people, I, you know, I, I don't know how naturally you can teach assertion. You're never going right. to get a good deal without it. So naturally you think you have that, you know, that assertive nature also? My, my, my caveman response yeah. is in, in response to a threat. It's either fight, flight, or make friends. Yeah. Those are the three responses. Uh, the fight is my natural born response. Yeah. You know, I see, it is. I read the story of Davy Crockett killing a bear with a Bowie knife, and I thought, that's cool. <laughs> and some other people think, that's stupid. Why would you let a bear get that close to you <laughs> at night? And yet other people would say, <laughs> Oh, the poor bear. <laughs> so, <laughs> then you laugh at them, yeah. Yeah, you know, those are the three types. How do you prep right before something? You're about to get online with the most critical, escalated situation possible, whether it's someone has hostages or they're a terrorist and they have someone. How do you prep internally? Like I've talked to Olympic athletes and they'll say something over their head. Or What do you do pre-call to psych yourself up or, or your, your methods? 
All right, so if I know that there's anger on the other side, then I practice hearing myself using the late night FM DJ voice. I'm just here to help us both work this out. And that'll put me in that zone. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm upset, then I'll tell myself, you know, I'm lucky to be having this conversation at all. Because uh, uh, a positive frame of mind puts me in a 31% more effective frame of mind. My brain will work up to 31% faster if I'm in a positive mood. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it will come to me. Um, I'll think faster. I'll figure it out. I'll be more empathic. Um, and, I'll, and you'll like me more. And you'll be more likely to make a deal. And I, and I actually had this. I was rehearsing in my brain a, con a conversation with someone I was unhappy with. And I couldn't think of the right labels. Mm. And the minute I stopped myself and I said, you know, the only reason you're having this call is because you're successful. And this person is bringing business to you that you wouldn't have otherwise. You're lucky to be in this call. Mm. And as soon as I had, you know, I know it's a cliche. You were grateful. But the attitude of gratitude yeah. puts me in a positive frame of mind and I'm smarter. And yeah. I'll do better in a business negotiation if I say, look, I'm lucky to be talking to you at all. Yeah. It's a sign of success. Yeah. I love that. How did you, again, like you, you have these terms, like the label, the mirroring, the, you know, how did you come up with the DJ voice? Because that's, again, something you may have just done naturally to soothe the other side. How did you actually realize consciously you were doing that? That was an accident. Um, that started when I was first training on the hotline. Uh, I think because I was nervous in the skills and I was so focused on the skills that, you know, when I, I'd, I'd answer the phone, hotline was helpline, and I'd say, hello, this is helpline. And after the first call I did that on the phone, the reviewer said, man, your voice is great. And I went mm. like, wow, what did I do? I had no idea. So I, I played it back in my head and I heard myself doing that. And then I tried to think of the descriptor, and somewhere along the line, I realized it sounded like the late night FM DJ mm -hmm. for those of us that grew up listening to FM radio. Right. Yeah, you know, I was listening to an interview with you, Chris, and you, I think, said that sometimes, or maybe it was in the book, up to seven people are listening sometimes on these um, hostage right. calls. So, <laughs> right. what are people, what is everyone listening for? All right, yeah, I mean, there's, it's, uh, in any conversation, there's like this smorgasbord, this buffet of potential information. So we're listening to adjectives. Yeah. We're listening to tone of voice. We're listening to inflection. We're listening to the between the lines descriptors when someone's really passionate about something. We're listening to personal pronouns. Are they plural or are they singular? The more they mm. use plural pronouns, the more powerful they are. That's interesting. The more they use singular pronouns, the less powerful they are. We're listening to whether or not they use profanity and their choice of profanity. We're listening to how long they talk. We're listening to the change in tone of voice. Um, a friend of mine uh, in Los Angeles, Ned Coletti, the former general manager of the Dodgers, great negotiation practitioner. He would say in a two-hour conversation with a sports agent, there's going to be 90 seconds of solid gold. And I'll say, what's that 90 seconds and how do you know right. what it is? Yeah. You know, and as a practitioner, he didn't really know until I asked him. He said, well, it's, it's going to be a change in voice. Hmm. It's going to be a change in tone. It's going to be a change in how they describe something, whether or not they say, I can get, I've got, I think I can get. Those are all three completely different descriptors that are the tip of the iceberg of their position. And so he's, his characterization of positions. And he, you know, that's Floyd Mayweather Jr. again. Uh, Ned Coletti knowing what to listen for but not being able to explain it. Right. But he knows what he's listening for yeah. instinctively over, over time. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, he and I, when we talk about it, we've given presentations where he's a great practitioner. I'll interrupt him and I'll say, all right, here's what he's doing. Right. This is what he's listening for. You know, Michael Jordan, the great performers are rarely great coaches. Right. Magic Johnson, maybe the best basketball player that ever lived. Horrible coach because he learned how to do it without explaining it. And, and really, I think I'm a, I'm a better negotiation coach than I am a negotiator. I think I'm a pretty good negotiator. But I can coach you up quickly because I've understood how, you know, how to help you get it better. 
I like to actually think of myself more as Phil Jackson than Michael Jordan. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the book helped you process those things that you actually did. It did. It did. It, it helped a lot. And it, it really then it was the final stages on explaining hostage to business. Because that was the first time we actually, I realized that anything needed to be explained from three different angles before somebody could get it. So a hostage, that's right. A personal, that's right. A business, that's right. Yeah. And that'll work. What was it with the, was there a pattern of the tone change that your, your friend discovered? Um, no. Uh, and some of it is, the first part of the conversation is for me to understand what your default tone is, how you're going to talk when you're just talking matter of factly. Mm. And some of that might be like, hey, how you doing today? Mm. You know, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. You know, some of the small talk actually is important because I need to lay down your pattern so that I can compare the changes too. Mm -hmm. It's actually the way a polygraph works. Oh, I see. If you take a polygraph, they ask you control questions to lay down your normal pattern. What's your father's middle name? What you have for breakfast? What day of the week is it? Mm. That's how that's your normal pattern. And right. then as soon as you change away from that, I see. all I need to do is look for the change. Once I see. I've got your, your go to yeah, pattern. Yeah, it's almost like a tell and poker, maybe somewhat too. Exactly. Right? And you know, it's 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 a version of a tell. The problem is when you're looking for tells, somebody might have seventy five tells. But you've got one normal pattern. Yeah. So if I know your normal pattern, all I need to know is when you change. Yeah. I don't need to know whether it's a change of tone of voice, whether it's a hesitation, whether it's you hold your breath, whether you look up and left, or whether you look down. Because you do all those things at different times. Mm -hmm. I just need to know it's a change. Yeah. There's one thing in the book that you talk about is there's always leverage. Right. right? And that's... I understand that, but in these like high pressure situations, it almost seems counterintuitive. Was it when was a time and you know that now, but when was there a time that you thought you didn't have leverage before you realized there's always leverage? Well, um, if the other side is not communicating at all, then they don't see communication as a tool. Mm. And if they see communication as a tool, then I've got leverage. Because mm. and especially if they're trying to communicate with me. I can get out in front of that. I can corral it in some way. I can guide it. Um, one of the, uh, as a hostage taking, we knew, we had to learn early on that if the hostage taker either wasn't communicating with us at all or he put somebody between us, he's putting up a barrier and that's a problem. Mm. And that no matter how dire the situation is, if he picks up the phone, he's given me the opportunity to influence him. Mm hmm. And so then we just started, I just took it for granted. If they picked up the phone, I got a shot. Right. It might not be a, a, a high percentage shot, yeah. but I have a shot. There is a threat. If I listen to the thread, I can pull on it gently and I can unravel. Mm -hmm. And so if you talk to me, you're giving me leverage. Yeah. What was the situation where you, you knew there was always leverage, but someone else looking at it was like, there's no leverage here? Like, well, I think... Um, <clears throat> With our terrorists in the Philippines, yeah, and especially with terrorists, they start making threats. And you make all these presumptions. That is a terrorist. They won't listen. Uh, they're making threats. They said it, and so therefore they meant it. Well, the real issue is how specifically did they say it? And I'm looking for anything that's vague. And as soon as it's vague, I know that's my way in. Mm -hmm. where, where, is the, where, is the, where are the vagaries? And so if we don't get our money, we're going to kill the hostage. Um, there's a lot of vagueness because they didn't say when and they didn't say how. Mm -hmm. And it's beginning to understand the specificity of the threat, who, what, when, and how. If any one of those are, are not there, then there's a vagueness and there's a way in. Yeah. Some of the influential books for you besides your own. You referenced the, the no book a lot. Start with no. Jim Camp's book, Start with no. Camp's uh, theory was if you make people feel like it's okay to say no, you preserve their autonomy and they relax. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what hostage negotiation is all about. Yeah. And because people will die over their right to say no. Now, and Camp says that in his book. So what we did was, all right, so if, they want, if their right to say no is that important to them, what happens psychologically when they actually say no? And that's where we took that, 
to the next step. Yeah. So Camp's book was very influential. Um, uh, the chapter from Bob Manukin's book, uh, Beyond Winning, hmm. a chapter called The Tension Between uh, Empathy and Assertiveness. Yeah. I mean, I still assign that. And um, that chapter that uh, Bob Manukin wrote makes that entire book worth it because he does such a beautiful job of explaining empathy that you kind of need to understand that to understand tactical empathy. Right. And so, I, 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 like I said, I still assign it. I'm still assigning stuff from uh, Daniel Goldman's book, recent book, Focus. Mm. And he breaks empathy down into three types of empathy. One of them is the cognitive empathy that, that, that I practice. And I think that that's enlightening also. So, you know, those, those are bits and pieces here and there of some really good stuff that's yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. Anything written by Adam Grant is extraordinary. His yeah, book, yeah. Originals, is very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, Give and Take was fantastic also. Yes. Um, so why did you decide to write the book? Um, well, uh, I felt like that there was always a book there, but we needed to make sure that we sort of had a, an entire process from beginning to end yeah. and how all the skills applied. And then we discovered some truly new stuff. You know, I've been applying the hostage negotiation skills at the McDonough School of Business in Georgetown to great effect for a while. Yeah. And we, we kept, you know, labels. We really refined labels and made them very tactical. Um, getting enough solid feedback to know how powerful the word no is and that you could, it could be a game changer. Yeah. And then getting enough uh, instances of that's right as game changers. And it, it took several years of proof yeah. of concept in a business world and we've, we felt like we had it. How did you decide to choose the co-author or a co-author? Tall Roz is a superstar. Yeah. And I had actually read a book that he'd written and co-authored called Never Eat Alone. Fantastic book, Keith yeah. Ferrazzi, yeah. yeah. In 2005, one of the best business books of 2005. Mm. Phenomenal book on networking. I yeah. mean, it's the Bible on networking. And besides being packed with great information, the structure was readable. Yeah. I enjoyed reading that book. It was actually yeah. fun to read. Yeah. And I wanted my book to be fun to read, and right. finally I connected with Tall, and uh, and he made it fun to read. Right. I was going to ask, how do you convince someone who's a top <coughs> author to do the book? But that's your job, so you can convince him, right? Well, he was very straightforward. I mean, he, he thought it was a great project for, from the beginning, yeah. and uh, it actually took the involvement of the publisher to bring him in. And he was just, he, he was a superstar. I mean, he is a superstar. You read anything he's written, yeah. any article, any magazine article, it's going to be enlightening and well-written. What didn't make the book, Chris, that was a great story, but you can't put everything into the book? Well, uh, you know, we had, we had lots and lots of examples. Yeah. Um, what was one of your and, favorites that maybe got cut out because you know, just I'm not, something I'm not else. sure if the... In the you know, I t I've talked about the Christmas tree so many times, the negotiation between the husband and the wife, that I'm not 100% sure that it's in the book. But it was, you know, never be so sure of what you want that you wouldn't take something better. Right. And it's, you know, the husband wants an artificial tree, the wife wants a real one. And the husband's got a ton of practical reasons. He's absolutely convinced it's the most practical answer. Right. And when the, he finds out why the wife wants a real tree, he changes his mind. He knows her solution is better than his. Mm -hmm. And how would you split the difference between an artificial tree and a real tree? <laughs> how would you compromise on that? Yeah. When her answer was right, I mean, he was, he was mm -hmm. flexible and he was open. What do people disagree with most? Or what do you get the biggest objections from You know, people are, people are uh, afraid to let the other side go first. They're so desperate to make their points first. They feel out of control. Um, people are the real counterintuitive is something we call the accusations audit, which people are scared to death of that. You know, let me list down the number of names that you might call me because you're mad at me. And let me say, oh, look, it's, I'm sure it seems like I'm a jerk. I'm sure it seems like I don't care about you. Yeah. I'm sure it seems like I'm trying to bully you. People are horrified to do that. Horrified. Yeah. Uh, cause they want to say, I don't want to seem like a jerk. They want right. to deny it. There's a tiny, tiny adjustment that scares people to death. Is it just ego? What do you think it is? It's, yeah, it's ego, it's fear. 
we believe we're so used to denying negatives and having them cause a negative to get bigger yeah. that we don't know that the recognition of the negative has the opposite effect. Yeah. And so they've, they've said, I've done that in the past. I've said, you know, I don't want you to think I'm a bad guy. And the other side screamed at me. Well, that's a denial. Mm. And even I even had a, a, a guy who's running a publicity firm in Washington, D.C. say, no, 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 never, never introduce a negative. And then he says, the classic example of how that backfired is when in the early 70s, the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, said, I'm not a crook. And I said, actually, you're wrong. That's not the introduction of a negative. That's a denial of a negative. Mm. And that's why that went wrong. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that don't see the two millimeter shift to paraphrase Tony Robbins, because I'm a fan, Yeah, yeah. Um, that makes the thousand yard difference, the tiny little black swan that changes everything. Yeah, I mean, you did this too. I think there was some situation where you had a contract and then they wouldn't pay you the full amount, right? Right. And then when you got on the call with some of the people, what'd you tell them? Well, we had, it was, it was coaching, um, uh, I was coaching a student and they had a contract that was going down the tubes mm. and it was a really bad relationship. And she sat down, um, based on what I taught her and made a list of every accusation the other side was going to make. I'm sure we seem like the big, big, bad contractor who's trying to squeeze a little guy and on and on and on and on. And by the, and, and her, the only reason why her associate went along with her was because they tried everything else and it, and it didn't work yeah. and they were going to lose millions of dollars. Right. And it, literally, he said, you know, nothing else has worked, so let's go with this. And it took three conversations. The first conversation, after they did the laundry list, the other side said, we appreciate everything you said. And they, they closed the meeting. Mm -hmm. And by the time they got done, they repaired the relationship. And my student had pulled an additional between $1 and $2 million in profit. Wow. So repaired the relationship, made more money. Yeah. Can't beat that. No, it's um, not bad, right? Chris, I always ask because it's Inspired Insider, and I appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. Um, in your book, anyone should check out Never Split the Difference on Audible, Amazon. Um, I always ask, what's been the lowest point in your career and how you pushed through? And then we'll talk about the proudest moment. Well, uh, and they were, they were, unfortunately, they were both very close together really? and, and in, the, in, the, in the same case. Um, when I get the call at about 5.30 in the morning, the Martin Burnham had been killed in the Philippines. To me, that was, uh, that was the lowest point professionally, personally, that I, that I had in my entire career because I thought we were going to get him out. We, and, and the high point had been about a month and a half earlier when the director of the FBI came to the Philippines and we thought we were going to get him out and we were implementing a brand new strategy under the United States government. And since it was brand new and it was very counterintuitive, the director of the FBI came to Manila and when, he, and, uh, when a guy running a, a Filipino office said, Director, this is, this is Chris Voss, his eyes lit up in recognition. He knew my name before mm. he'd met me. And that blew me away. Wow. I mean, I thought, wow, the director of the FBI is a world figure. And a world figure has heard of me. And it was a very heady moment. Yeah. We had a private meeting with the director and my, my team. And I thought we were on the verge of getting the hostages out and, and under the new policy. And I told him that. I said, I, you know, I think there's a 70% chance they're out by the weekend. And, for, uh, I, you know, and things started to go bad immediately thereafter. And two months later, I get the call that uh, Martin Burnham was dead. And it just, mm. it, it's self-indulgent for me to say that it was bad for me because it wasn't a member of my family that died. Right. You know, it was nothing compared to what the Burnham family went through. Right. And Gracia Burnham was wounded and Morton Burnham was, was killed. Friendly fire, botched rescue attempt. Philippine military shot him, not knowing that there were hostages yeah. in, in the camp. And then there was, was a... friendly fire. Friendly fire, killed by friendly fire. The bad guys didn't kill him. Why did and it go alert. bad? The, uh, the, the scout rangers knew that they'd, they were on a routine patrol. They st uh, we were told it was routine. Um, I don't know that they weren't guided there by another government agency, but uh, uh, they thought they would come across a camp of terrorists. They didn't believe there were hostages in the camp, and they formed a skirmish line in the tree in the tree line and opened fire. Mm. And there were hostages, and hostages were killed. 
And so that was, for me, that was, that was uh, thinking we were going to get hostages out and having them killed by the good guys mm. was, was tough. Jeez. I have one last question, Chris. Where, first, first off, where should we point people towards? Where should they check out online? I go to blackswanltd.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D, like limited.com. Yeah. It's our website. You can, uh, we've, you can sign up. We've got a free advisory uh, twice-a-month negotiation newsletter. It's yeah. complimentary. Yeah. Um, you know, that uh, short, sweet, uh, lots of different applications, stuff you could use every day. Yeah. Um, that's, that's for free. And then we've got a lot of information about the book and, and other training that we get. Yeah. I highly recommend Never Split the Difference. And I was reading the article today, Chris, on how to get the upper hand in any take it or leave it offer. And just some really, real short and sweet, but very applicable for any situation. Thanks, man. You talk yeah, about yeah. some of the, the mirroring and the labels and, and things like that. People should definitely sign up and check that out. Yeah, and I give you exact things to say too, right? I yeah. Mean, it's some word for word Verbatim, stuff really, verbatim. Really is effective. Yeah, I love it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I use uh, that. I, two sentence email saves me a couple thousand dollars just on my insurance um, <laughs> because I ask the question, how do we get this to be lower? Or how do we, I, I oh, think, I, think I said, like, how can we lower the rate? Question mark. And that one sentence will save me thousands of dollars yeah, because that- they immediately came back with lowering it. Yeah, beautiful. So, Nicely done. So thank you. Um, well done. Yeah. Last question. Um, tell me what you learned from your son. So he's been negotiating with you since he was two, right? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So And he works with you. Yep. Right? Yeah. So what's his role and, and what have you learned from him? Well, he handles uh, – we've got a, a lot of uh, internet web-based instruction. He handles that entirely. Yeah. He's really advanced the understanding of the three types. What do you and- mean? Uh, well, you know, the fight, flight, or make friends. Mm. He's been fascinated by that and has really seen the differences in the reactions. And then a lot of times we're talking stuff through. There's a phrase that we use, uh, forced empathy. I mean, why do you use empathy with someone? Because you want empathy in return. And what are the trigger moments? What forces empathy, whether the other side likes it or not? You know, and, and that's why you're trying to set up this entire dynamic. So he's really added to the depth of thought on the types and the tactical use of empathy. And, and he actually, as I've come to find out, got himself out of trouble as a teenager all bunch of times. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me. And I don't know if you have a few minutes or not, but I'd love to have you talk about the services, some of the services you offer at Black Swan. Do you have another call right now? Or? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So... Talk about the services that people like. What you know? What can they hire you for, or your company for, or what can they explore online uh, outside of the book? Well, well, we'll we'll help you get better at negotiation through some of the. Uh, we've got an email negotiation course that's coming out. Uh, that's mm. that is out now, but it comes. You get one lesson per day for twenty four days, nice. which gets you past a twenty one day uh, rough threshold of bringing on a new skill. It takes about twenty one days of practice to to make something more a part of your bones yeah and that's the design of that um we've got what's the structure of that so it's an online training so they'll get an email um different practice lessons right you get you get a short sweet lesson into your inbox once a day the idea is uh since it's short and sweet it's easy easy to digest you can start your day sort of aligned with a another aspect of a negotiation skill yeah so it's a it's a great way to start your day yeah. And to make your negotiations that whole day uh, more effective. And so we've got that. We've got the, uh, the, the newsletter that comes up. We, uh, we've got some in-person training that we're going to do in New York later this month. Yeah, I and saw that. Yeah. It's and you so, and yeah. someone else, right? Was- yeah. Well, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's Jim Camp's son, Todd Camp. Oh, got it. Because it's, uh, the, the, the ideas are very complementary. And... So, and Todd's got a very effective coaching model that we like a lot. And we've just been collaborating in as much in appreciation to how much I like their approach. So we're giving you a dose of both. So people can, can companies hire you to do something like a, a training too? 
Awesome. And will will tailor training for your company anywhere from a half a day to two days yeah. with a lot of supporting stuff. Yeah. Um, we can come out for a day and then we, we're going to want to coach you because a day is a short period of time. Yeah. But we've got a lot of follow-on stuff so that it becomes part of people's bones. So there, there's training and coaching. We we can be your wingman in a negotiation, hmm. but really? you, you'll get farther if we coach you. Because their defenses go up if you're there or why? Well, um, I can get you better at negotiations faster than you can explain your business. So I'll, I'll help you get better at picking out those two millimeter changes. Yeah. And you'll get it faster because you know your business better than I do. Right. I can help your negotiation aspect. Yeah. And so that's why we coach. Yeah. Who are the companies that you've found tend to find this the most valuable? Like they see the inherent value right away. What you know, type it's, of company? More, it's more people, people. and it's, 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 you know, the, the whale hunters, if you will, the big producers, uh, the people that are looking for game changing skills. Yeah. Um, so and, I'm just saying, cause if people are looking and they, um, have a referral to give to you like myself, who would be like, what would give me an idea of an example of, of companies or people who have hired you? Uh, well, yeah, I, I'm giving you, um, if, if you don't already think that you're automatically a good negotiator, I mean, IT companies, the one industry that isn't kidding itself about how good it is about negotiation are really IT companies because they're making their um, success based on nonverbal communication by and large. Mm. I'm actually trying to expand a little bit more into, into Silicon Valley these days. Yeah. Because every, everybody else on the planet, if they're successful in business, automatically assumes they're successful as negotiators. Right. Chances are you're succeeding in spite of your negotiation skills and because of your business acumen. Right. And They're compensating. Um, well, you've, you've, you've at least learned what terms are going to kill you and you're not taking those terms anymore. Yeah. And you've been suckered enough times by hope that you're no longer taking a... Uh, uh, um, uh, a contract because it's going to bring you great stuff in the right. future. Yeah. You know, there are tangibles here that you can harvest. Yeah. So, um, a lot, but uh, if an industry, if you will, a little bit more of the internet based industries, I think are, are, yeah. are where we're going to expand more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, go to Black Swan LTD. You'd be a fool, in my opinion, to not buy, never split the difference. So, Chris. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.